السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين استفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الأنبياء وعلى آله الأتقياء وأصحابه الأسفياء أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهر رمضان الذي ينزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان ومن شاهد منكم الشهر فليسمه ومن كان مريضا ولا سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر ولتكملوا العسر ولتكبروا الله على ما هداكم ولعلكم تشكرون بارك الله لنا بارك الله لنا ولكم في القرآن العظيم ونفعنا وإياكم بالآيات والذكر الحكيم My dear brothers and respected elders, we begin in the name of Allah, thank Him, praise Him, glorify Him, seek His forgiveness and ask Him to send His infinite mercy upon His beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to guide us all to the right path so that we can all live like Muslims, die like Muslims and rise like Muslims on the day of Qiyamah. My dear brothers, this blessed month coming, on, coming our way is no ordinary blessing of Allah. Allah has given us the best of everything. Allah has given us the best of the kalams, kalamullah, the best of the rasuls, the rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best of the days Friday, the best of the month Ramadan, and made us the best of the ummah. And in this blessed month, the best month is a night which is very blessed and the best of the nights. And some ulama say that the blessings in Ramadan, they are more than the blessings of the whole year. In fact, Ramadan is such a blessed month if one person can spend, not the whole month properly, if you can spend one night in this month properly, you can gain more reward, not just to be earned in a year, but one night spent properly in Ramadan can earn you more reward than the whole ibad than ibadat of your whole life. One night is more powerful in Ramadan than a thousand months. And a thousand months equates to 83 years and four months. Allah doesn't say it equals. Thousand months equate to 83 years and four months. But that one night isn't equal to 83 years and four months. It's better than 83 years and four months. Meaning one night in Ramadan alone can bring you more reward from Allah than what you could do in your entire life. So Ramadan is a life-changing time. Ramadan is such an important time. And all these blessings of Ramadan are because of Kalamullah, because of Quran. And Quran is such a blessing. Fadlu kalamillahi ala sa'iril kalamika fadlillahi ala khalqi The status of Quran over everything else is like that of Allah himself over his creation. Just as there is no one like Allah, there is nothing in this world like Quran. Some people when they are faced with a difficult task, get some help from brothers, friends, whoever. And there are presently more than 7 billion humans. No Maulana, no Mufti Sahib, no Shaykh al Hadith Sahib. Allah says in Quran, if all the humans in the world got together, and not just the humans, if all the jinns joined in as well, and if there are 7 billion humans, there are many times more jinn in this world. You all know about jinns? I hope I don't give some kids sleepless nights tonight. <laughs> There are 7 billion humans in the, according to Quran, there are more jinns in this world than humans. Ya ma'ashar al-jinni qadistaktartum min al-ins. Because the jinns are a head start. Allah made jinns. Wal janna khalaqna min qabl. Before Adam and Islam, Allah created jinns on this earth. So they had a head start and they live long lives. <coughs> there was a great scholar by the name of Ibn Hajar Asqalani. Ulama are aware of him. He's written a book entitled Ali Saba Fi Tamizi Sahaba and there he's mentioned the name of a jinn, Hama. Hama bin Him, bin Lahim, bin Laqis, bin Iblis. And he's mentioned about him that, that he came to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once and he said, Ya Rasulullah, when Adam Alayhi Salam's sons, Habil and Qabil, when Qabil killed Habil, he said, I was a young man. Then I became Muslim at the hands of Nuh Alayhi Salam. 
than I was with various different prophets. And Isa alayhi salam said to me, if I remain alive and you appear, I should convey you this salam. So this particular jinn lived from Adam alayhi salam to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's time. That's how long lives some of them have. Head start, long lives. So there are many times more jinns in this world than humans. So if all the humans and all the jinns got together to help one another, Allah says in the Quran, if they will help one another, assisted one another, cooperated one another to make something like Quran, they will not be able to do so. Why? Because it is the word of Allah. In Arabic, there is saying, there is a saying, Kalamul muluki mulukul kalam, the words of the kings are the kings of the words. There is no bigger king than Allah. So there is nothing in this world more powerful than Kalamullah, which is Quran. So the month of Ramadan, some of you might think, month of hunger, starvation, uh, meaning fasting, perhaps in somebody's eyes, according to someone's understanding. Yes, in the month of Ramadan, we fast. Some people just remain Remain hungry and thirsty. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has stated in hadith, Malam yada qawla zur wal amala bihi, the one who doesn't leave lying in the month of Ramadan, falaysa lillahi hajatun fi an yada atama wa sharaba. Allah has no need for such a person who has left his eating and drinking. He's left eating and drinking, he thinks he's fasting, he's playing games with fasting. Such a man, fasting is not just about remaining hungry and thirsty. Fasting is about controlling your emotions, your feelings, your behavior, well, everything that you do, all aspects of your life. Uh, fasting is your spiritual training. Many people might think, you know, that this is a month of fasting. It is a month of fasting. But more than the month of fasting, Ramadan is the month of Quran. And by fasting, <coughs> what is Allah trying to build within us or trying to teach us or trying to explain to us or trying to develop within us? Allah doesn't need us to remain hungry and thirsty. Allah wants to create ease for you. Allah, does, Allah doesn't want anything. Allah doesn't want to put you through difficulty. Allah is putting you through this training, through this tarbiyah, uh, to create ease for you. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ Allah doesn't want difficulty for you. Allah wants to give you ease. And you, in order to get ease, to appreciate, you need a certain level of training. You need a certain level of disciplining. You need a certain level of discipline measures in, put in place. In Ramadan, it's not that people don't eat and drink. How many of you don't eat and drink in Ramadan? Put your hands up if you don't eat and drink in Ramadan. Nobody. Everybody eats and drinks in Ramadan. Normally people are on a seafood diet. You know what a seafood diet? It's not fish. I know, especially our Bengali brothers love their fish and rice. <laughs> uh, but that's not seafood. That's not what I mean rather. Seafood diet, they seafood and they can't control <laughs> MashaAllah, they go for it. Uh, one is seafood, yes, MashaAllah, fish and prawn, whatever. But other is sea, seafood diet. In the morning, first thing, MashaAllah, attack on the fridge in kitchen before you go to school work. When you come back straight to the kitchen and whenever presented, MashaAllah, people can't resist. They are on a seafood diet. Uh, but in Ramadan, you've even got halal food. Halal food, somebody, there is nothing more halal in this world than Zamzam and Medina dates. MashaAllah, Baraka. There is so much Baraka in things from Medina. Allahu Akbar. There is so much Baraka in Zamzam. You know, the Arabs, wherever they dig, they get oil, MashaAllah. You know, but Zamzam has been going thousands of years. Rasulullah said, Zamzam de Mashuriba. Whatever you drink Zamzam for, that's, Allah will give you that. And many years ago when there used to be no, those of you who've been to Makkah, mashallah, put your hands up if you've been to Makkah. Mashallah. May Allah take us all there again and again. Amen. And there was a time when there were no Zamzam Towers. Uh, and none of those fancy hotels. 
people used to just go there simply nothing there and no hotels people would go and survive purely on zamzam drink zamzam up to month long mashallah no problem and they would survive many people have gone to makkah with incurable diseases and spend their time mashallah filling themselves with zamzam morning and evening come back totally cured from their illnesses so much barakah in zamzam the dates of Medina, when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to Medina, Rasulullah made a dua, Ya Allah, you, your Nabi Ibrahim made dua for Makkah, and I, your Rasul, make dua that you put even more barakah in Medina than in Makkah. And just as, mashallah, Zamzam goes all over the world, the dates of Medina go over the, all over the world as well. Even Tesco is selling them, mashallah, <laughs> dates from Medina. So someone went in, in, in Ramadan to, to Umrah and they came back with a few days and they brought fresh Zamzam and fresh dates from Medina and you are fasting and you sat on the Dastar Khan in the Masjid to open your fast but there's still 10 minutes to go. Well, let alone 10 minutes, 2 minutes and you're sitting on the Dastar Khan fasting. Someone presents dates from Medina and Zamzam. What can be better? More Barakah than Zamzam and Medina dates. Are you going to take the zamzam and drink it? Are you going to drink it? There's still two minutes to go. Huh? No. no, why not? It's zamzam. Dates from Medina. No, but you are fasting. You have to wait. <coughs> when we do other things, pray, mashallah, in front of people with brothers. Rabbi sallallahu alayhi wa said, everything that a person does, Allah increases its rewards. Tenfold. Allah increases the reward of every good deed tenfold, minimum, up to seven hundred. Allah says, except fasting. Fasting is purely for me, and I personally will reward fasting people. Why? Nobody else really knows if you are fasting or not other than you and Allah. Now, mashallah, in, it's a month of May. <coughs> mashallah, fasting will do 18, 19 hours. A month of May and June. Wa ma'a adraka ma Ramadana fi June. Mashallah, 18, 19 hours fasting. And mashallah, you come at one o'clock for Zohar. Mashallah, the weather's become cold again and cool. But suppose it turns into hot and bright. And mashallah, you know, by the time you come one o'clock and then especially asr time, six, seven o'clock, you've been fasting 15, 16 hours and everybody's putting water in their mouths to make wudu. Everybody's in the queue, everybody putting water in your mouth. You put water in your mouth, but do you allow a single drop to trickle down your throat? Why not? Who would ever know? Allah. Who would ever know? Okay, might be in the masjid, somebody won't give him suspicious looks, but you are at home having a shower. The bathroom door is locked. Water pouring all over you, mashallah. Water pouring all over you. But do you allow a single drop to trickle down your throat? Who would ever know? So Allah says, fasting is purely between me and the person. Purely for me. Nobody in the world. You might get up with your family, have brought us for, for sahri, and you might come every day to the masjid, sit on the dastar khan for iftar. But whether you are fasting or not, either you know or Allah knows. So Allah says, I personally will give the reward for a fasting person. What's that stopping you from allowing a single drop of water to trickle down your throat? Except the fear of Allah and the awareness of Allah. So a man who has that awareness that nobody will know except Allah. Allah will know. We can hide and cheat everybody. Hide from everyone, cheat everyone, but no one can cheat Allah. Do you think that person will be able to commit some sin? Do any wrong? Because this man has no need to go down to the bottom of the 
وہ آدمی کو گناہ کر سکتا ہے سو فاسٹنگ دا مین تھنگ ان فاسٹنگ از کنٹرولنگ یور سیلف فرام کمیٹنگ سن ون اے ہول منتھ In the month of Ramadan, you don't just not eat. You, mashallah, save yourselves. Is it this paper right or? Okay. You save yourselves, not just from the unlawful. You refrain even from the lawful for a whole month. So that when Ramadan is over, at least, you can refrain from at least haram. جب ایک پورا مہینہ حلال چیزوں سے بھی بچتے بچتے رہے تو جب ایک پورا مہینہ گزرے گا تو حلال تو کیا تو کم از کم حرام سے تو بچ سکیں گے نا لو گیو یو این ایگزامپل یو سی وین سم تھنگ از لائک دس فولڈ اٹ لائک دس نا اف یو وانٹ ٹو اسٹریٹ اینڈ اف یو پٹ اٹ لائک دس اف از از گونا کم اسٹریٹ نو ان آڈر ٹو اسٹریٹ این اٹ یو ڈونٹ جس پٹ اٹ لائک دس یو ہیو ٹو بینڈ اٹ دا ادر وے and once you bent it the other way and then when you put it flat then it becomes so now we are so used to doing wrong things that when we are told to be straight people, most people can't so they need the training whereby they need to control themselves <coughs> even from what is normally permissible so that when after whole month when ramadan is over at least you can refrain from the unlawful and this allah refers to as taqwa that awareness of allah that nobody else will ever know but allah knows everything so the month of ramadan is because in our deen just as it is important to do good it is even more important to refrain from sins unlawful issues allah says wadharu zahir al ithm wa batina refrain from all forms of sins whether visible or invisible there are many sins allah doesn't say don't go don't, don't do them there are many allah does says don't even go near them wala taqrabu zina allah specifically mentions zina and we are living in such times of fitna and fasad do you know what is zina huh? yes no It's such an evil. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated there will come a time yakthuru zina when it will become very common and people subhanallah it's so difficult to save yourself. So Allah in the Quran doesn't say don't do zina. Allah says don't go near zina. Many immoral, indecent issues. Allah doesn't say don't do them. Allah says wala taqrabul fawahisha ma zahra bina wa ma batan. don't go anywhere near indecency immorality so many all forms of sins you have to stay clear from and in our deen if you have mashallah in our deen it's even more important to refrain from sins than to do good deeds it's important to do good deeds you must pray you must fast in the month of ramadan you must pay zakat perform hajj if you can afford to do so whatever opportunity you get نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في روايه حديث said لا تحقرن شيئا من المعروف don't look down upon any opportunity to do good if you get any opportunity to do anything good do it you don't know you might not get another opportunity and you need every every word of whatever you can gather but نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم went on to say do you know who is really poor man people said the one who doesn't have any money rasulullah said the muflis the poor man of my ummah is not someone who doesn't have any money but someone who will bring many many good deeds so many that if they were placed on mountains the mountains would crumble under their weight but they would have wronged someone insulted someone cheated someone made fun of someone stolen something from someone and on the day of qiyamah they will all come and make their claim in the court of allah and on that day you won't be able to settle up with outstanding money on that day all settlement will take place with your good deeds so whatever they've made claim allah will have a certain level of compensation settlement figure 
from your prayers, from your other good deeds, which will be given to the people that, that have been wronged. So much so that all of those good deeds, if they were placed on a mountain, the mountain would have crumbled under their weight, will be given to others. But there will still be people who are yet to claim what they are due, and the man's got nothing to offer. So their sins will be placed on his account. And this man will be dragged to Jahannam, not for the sins he's committed, but for the sins that others have committed. So cheating, lying, deceiving, Allahu Akbar. Why does, how can someone lie and cheat and deceive and make fun of others? If he had that awareness of Allah, that others don't know, Allah knows. So in the month of Ramadan, that's what's being developed. If Ramadan and fasting can save you from even allowing a single drop of water to trickle down your throat, it should definitely save you from cheating, hurting, harming, insulting, making fun of other people. So the essence of Ramadan is to save yourselves from a sinful way of life. Whole month, 18, 19 hours, you stop eating and drinking, and even if you are married, Olama say that it's not good when you are fasting to look at your wife even lustfully, and mashallah, and so on. So, if a person <coughs> saves himself from anything, even which is lawful and permissible for a whole month, when the month is over, you should at least be able to refrain from unlawful. So, guna, sins. I picked up this glass to give an example. Suppose there was milkshake in here. And suppose the glass was even bigger. Massive. You know, and really nice, wonderful milkshake or something. And someone presented it to you. Brother, have mashallah. Really nice. And then you got accepted the offer. And you are about to drink it. But he said, brother, just please, one minute. That's all nice. It's 99.999% .999 okay. There's only one drop of urine in there. Will you drink it? Huh? So this is how important it is to refrain from sins. Now when a person does so, so much, but you're sinning, Allah doesn't like sins. Although for us Muslims, no problem. If a person sins, according to Islam, okay, you, you shouldn't <coughs> sin. But if you've sinned, Allah says, seek forgiveness from Allah. Last week was Easter, last weekend was Easter weekend. <coughs> you know what Easter weekend is? Why Christians celebrate Easter? Anybody know? Resurrection. Rebirth of Isa Huh? Rebirth of Isa Rebirth? I don't think anybody believes in rebirth. Of <coughs> Not rebirth, but resurrection. Christians believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sins and he died on the cross carrying their sin. Because for Christians, sin is such a problem, they think anybody who sins deserves to die. There is another religion called Hinduism. For them, sin is such a problem that there is anybody who commits a sin, oh, that's it, you've had it. If you commit a sin and you die, You've been committing sins. When you die, that's not the end of the story for you if you're a Hindu. They believe you'd come back to this world like a donkey or a monkey or a pig or a cat or a rat or a mouse. And if you behave like a good monkey or a good donkey or a good rat and a good mat or a mouse, then you can come back again in this world in a better form. And eventually, <coughs> you can achieve what they call nirvana, salvation. So for, if we, for Hindus, they believe there's nothing, no way out of sin. Except for you to become a good monkey or a good donkey or a good pig or a good rat or a good cat or whatever. Christians came up with another scenario. They said, if you sin, there's no way you can come out of sin. You deserve to die. And the only way for you to come out of sin is for God to come down in human form in the form of Isa alayhi salam and to carry your sins upon himself and die on the cross for you. It's like if somebody was a criminal and the police caught him and they put him in the court 
and the judge was a very kind judge. And the judge looked at that person and said, you know what, you're really a bad guy. And you've done something terrible. You deserve to die. But what I'm going to do, okay, because I'm a good judge, I'm going to let you off, but in place of you, I'm going to send my son to prison. Does it make sense? Why should Allah Nauzubillah, punish an innocent soul for the sins of people to come centuries and millenniums later? So for Christians, sin is also a very, very big problem. But for Muslims, sin is a problem, but not as much. Because if we sin, then as long as, as soon as somebody has sinned, if they seek forgiveness from Allah, even a terrible sin, you remember Allah, you seek forgiveness for your sin, Allah will forgive you. So much so, in Hadith Al-Qudsi, it says, You son of Adam, as long as you keep hoping in me and you keep calling upon me for forgiveness, I will carry on forgiving you and, and this doesn't bother me. If your sins were to pile up to the heavens, لو بلغت ذنوبك علان السماء ثم استغفرتني غفرت لك على ما كان منك ولا أبالي. If you were to, your sins were to pile up to the heavens and you were to seek forgiveness, Allah says, I will forgive you and it doesn't bother me. So for Muslims, if we do anything wrong, we repent, seek forgiveness from Allah. And then what we do? In the Quran, Allah says, إن الحسنات يذهبن السيئات Good deeds wipe out bad deeds. Rasulullah said, if you sin, then follow it up with a good deed. Because the good deed will compensate for your sin. And mashallah, whenever you do your, you do your prayers, when Ramadan sets in, from one Ramadan to the next Ramadan is kafara. When you fast properly your whole month, Rasulullah said, Man sama Ramadan imanum wa ihtisaban, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambi. Whosoever fasts in the month of Ramadan with iman and hopeful reward, Allah forgives all their past sins. Man qama Ramadan imanum wa ihtisaban, whosoever prays in Ramadan, meaning at night, implying taraweeh, Allah will forgive all their past sins. Whosoever prays in Laylatul Qadr, Allah will forgive all their past sins. And then we are also hopeful in the intercession of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the day of Qiyamah that Rasulullah will intercede in the court of Allah, put in a good word for us to be forgiven. And also, if not even that, Allah reserves His divine right to forgive those who believe in Him. Allah won't forgive shirk. Apart from shirk, Allah will forgive everything. So for Muslims, <laughs> there's so much hope and there's so much to look forward to in the mercy of Allah in his forgiveness that Allah will forgive us. Firstly, by repenting to Allah. Secondly, by doing good deeds. Thirdly, in the hope of shafaat, intercession of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And fourthly, we hope Allah, because Allah is merciful, Allah will forgive us anyway. So Ramadan is the month of forgiveness. When people, MashaAllah, have been fasting from morning till evening, leaving off their food and drink, even halal, what's permissible affairs in the month of Ramadan, Allah is really mindful. On the day of Eid, when people gather to celebrate Eid, and they've come to the masjid or wherever to pray Eid, Allah asks the angels, Ya Malaikati, O oh my angels, look at my servants. They have fulfilled what was required of them. What is their reward? So the angels as well put in a good word for the believers who've been fasting. Ya Allah, these humble servants of yours, they have done whatever you commanded them to do. So, Ya Allah, give them the reward that they deserve. So, Allah says to the angels, Oh, my angels, you bear witness that I have forgiven. Uh, so, for Muslims, MashaAllah, we have so much to look forward to in terms of, because when you give up your, your food and drink and your desires for the pleasure of Allah, Allah is mindful of that. Allah appreciates that. So for Muslims, mashallah, fasting in the month of Ramadan is really to strengthen their iman and trust in Allah that, you know, that, that Allah is watching and they will not cheat anyone. They will not wrong anyone and they will control themselves. They will not allow the nafs and shaitan to get the better of them.
Rasulullah said, إِذَا دَخَلَ رَمَضَانِ When Ramadan begins, فُتِحَتْ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ وَغُلَّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ وَسُلْسَلَةِ الشَّيَاطِينَ Allah says to the angels, let the gates of Jannah be opened. So that it becomes easy for people to earn paradise. So you become worthy of paradise. وَغُلَّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ So Allah orders the angels similarly to shut the gates of Jahannam. As though Allah is telling you, look, I don't want you to go to Jahannam. Don't make yourself worthy of Jahannam. There is no reason for you to go to Jahannam. Prepare yourselves in such a way that you deserve to go straight to paradise. Because in paradise, Allah will give you whatever you will. Allah will give you so much. You know when people are settled in paradise? When people are settled in paradise, Allah Himself will visit the people of paradise. And Allah will say, Assalamu alaikum, ya, ya ibadi, O oh my servants, peace be upon you. Hal are you happy? All that you've been given, palaces made of gold and silver with robes and whatever you could wish, Allah will grant. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa stated that in paradise there are eight gates. Each gate representing excellence in a certain walk of life and deen. But for fasting people, people who fast, Allah has reserved a special gate. Uh, there is a special gate to paradise, it's called Rayyan. La yadkhuluhu illa sa'imun. For people who used to fast, from where they will be admitted with honor. So when they are entered into there, and they are settled in their palaces with their wives and everything good that they could possibly desire. Then Allah will say, Hal Are you happy? Just as when someone comes to our house and we try to entertain him and present the best that we can. And then at the end we say, Brother, can I get you something else? You know, when some guests go to somebody's house, some people say, Brother, you don't want anything to eat, do you? Meaning, please don't eat something. <laughs> Somebody went to somebody's house and said, Brother, what will you have? Something hot or cold? The man was a... He was a clever man and he said, Before dinner we'll have something cold, after dinner we'll have something hot. <laughs> so when somebody comes to your house, you entertain him, do the best that you can, but at the end you still say, Brother, can I get you something else? So when people are settled into paradise, Allah will say, Can I get you some halraditum? Aturiduna shayan azidukum. Do you want something else? People will say, Ya Allah, alam tubayid wujuhana wa tudkhilana jannata wa tunajjana min al-nar. Ya Allah, have you not enlightened our faces, saved us from Jahannam, put us into paradise? What else could we want? And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went on to say, For yukshaful hijab, Allah will raise the veils which exist between us and Allah. And there will be nothing even in paradise than to behold Allah Himself, to see Allah. In dunya we can believe in Allah, worship Allah, pray to Allah, obey Allah, call upon Allah, do zikr of Allah, but we can't see Allah. We can't see Allah in this world. In Jannah, there will be no need to pray, no need to do anything. You will see and meet Allah Himself. That will be the ultimate. And fasting, Allah says in one hadith, you know, the hadith, Allah says, I will reward according to some ulama. He says, Wa ana ujizabi. Allah says, I become the reward of a fasting person. Because a fasting person is specially dear to Allah. You've left everything for the pleasure of Allah. So Allah appreciates that. And along with fasting, the month of Ramadan is the month of Quran. Allah has mentioned it as a special favor. Ar-Rahmanu allama al-Quran. The most merciful is the one who taught you Quran. Rasulullah said, for every nation there is a matter of pride. And the pride of my ummah is Quran. Uh, Quran is such a blessing of Allah. Among the best people, khayrukum man ta'allam al-Quran wa The best amongst you are those who learn and teach Quran. And so when you've been reading Quran, fasting, and then at the end of all that, uh, you deserve your reward. And one of the rewards of Allah for a fasting person, and in Ramadan especially, is that Allah accepts your du'as. In the passage in Quran, in which Allah has made mention of Ramadan, 
Allah then goes on to say, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي أَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ When my servants ask you about me, I am near. So when I'm near, what happens? Allah says, أُجِيبُ دَعْوَ تَدَّعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ I listen, I accept the prayers of those who call upon me. So in Ramadan, among other things, one thing believers and Muslims should definitely do and increase in your supplication and du'as to Allah. Yes, we have to fast. You have to read Quran. So much Quran. One of the great scholars of Islam, his name was Imam Shafi, rahimahullah. He was one of the mujtahids. There were four great mujtahids. Imam Abu Hanifa Ramahullah was the first and the greatest, referred to in the books by scholars as Al Imam Al Azam, the greatest of the Imams. When we refer to Imam Abu Hanifa Ramahullah as an Imam Al Azam, many people become allergic. They say, Well, why are you calling Abu Hanifa Imam Al Azam the greatest Imam? Rasulullah was the greatest Imam. That's not quite right, brothers. Rasulullah wasn't an Imam. We don't refer to Rasulullah as an Imam like we refer to Imam Abu Hanifa. How can anybody compare Imam Abu Hanifa to Rasulullah? Rasulullah was Rasulul Azam, the greatest Rasul. When we say Imam Abu Hanifa was the greatest Imam, meaning when we when compared to other people like Imam Malik, Imam Shaf, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Rahimahumullah, Imam Abu Hanifa Rahimahullah was the greatest. We don't say it. Scholars have been saying it for centuries. So one of these four great Imams was Imam Shafi Rahimahullah. And he would read one Quran every day in Ramadan, one Quran every night in Ramadan, and one Quran in Tarawih. So reciting fasting during the day, putting Tarawih at night, mashallah, listening to the Quran, Allahu Akbar. And you know, It's a fact that most Muslims can't read Quran. MashaAllah, many of you might be able to read, MashaAllah. Come here, you're lucky to have such a wonderful masjid, MashaAllah, such wonderful ulama, teachers, qarisa, MashaAllah. But even back home, those who go back home, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Africa, there's hundreds of millions they can't read Quran properly. They can't even read Quran, let alone properly. And those who do can't read it properly. You know someone who's come, who's come recently from Pakistan or Bangladesh, huh? and when they come and they try to learn English, and they speak English, brother, what is your good name? <laughs> what do people say? He is what? Huh? Freshy. He's what? Freshy. Freshy. Yeah, freshy. <laughs> so it's a freshy. How can you tell a freshy? Because brother, what is your good name? So straight away you know he's a freshie. So when a person reads Quran, Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Lalami, the angel say, man, this guy is absolute freshie. <laughs> because Quran should be read with tarweed, with tajweed. And that's the only weed that you read out. <laughs> tajweed. <laughs> you understand? Some people like other weeds. Uh, but no, the only weed that a Muslim is allowed is Tajweed. So Quran deserves to be read with Tajweed, with proper makharij, qalqalahunna. But most Muslims can't do that. So what happens? Allah has given you an opportunity. You can't read Quran properly, but you can at, at least listen to Quran properly. Be reading is, you know, subhanAllah, many times when people, especially when they grow old and you try and teach them, you know, the qafs and the tha and the dhal and the dhad and the ta just don't come out. But you can at least listen. You can at least listen. So every Ramadan, the month of Quran, and you haven't learned to recite it properly with tajweed, so you can at least listen in most masajid, mashallah, brothers, they make special provisions and arrangements for someone who's a hafiz, mashallah, qari, reads nicely, mashallah, especially if you've got someone like qari sahab, I'm sure, mashallah, people, you know, they will be feel honored and enjoy listening to such a recitation, mashallah. So, if you don't study all Allah has given a chance to listen to the whole Quran that you can at least listen to the whole Quran. You can at least listen to the whole Quran being recited. And this 
takes place in the month of Ramadan in a special prayer called, which is prayed with? In how many rakats? 20. 20. You pray 20 rakats here? MashaAllah. And you don't just pray here. It began more than 1400 years ago. There's a very famous, you know, the month of Ramadan, month of Quran, month of fasting, and month of dua. Allah accepts you duas in this month. Dua is also a very important amal in the life of a Muslim. So much so that in Quran there are many duas. Allah has mentioned many stories of previous prophets. Adam alayhi salam story is dua. Nuh alayhi salam story is dua. Ibrahim alayhi salam story is dua. Musa alayhi salam story is dua. Ayyub alayhi salam story is dua. Yunus alayhi salam story and his dua. Rasulullah would begin his day with a dua and end his day with a dua. Quran begins with a dua and ends with a dua. So in Ramadan, you fast, you pray taraweeh, and you make as many duas as you can. Uh, but the first thing when Ramadan is declared, suppose inshallah on Sunday, the 6th of May, likely, most likely, <coughs> It will be announced. Rasulullah said, Sumu li ru'yatihi wa aftiru li ru'yati. Begin your month with seeing the moon and end your month with seeing. Do you get an opportunity to see the moon? MashaAllah, in England you can't even see the sun all the time, let alone the moon. <laughs> and so, but anyway, when it is declared that Ramadan has, become, has begun, suppose on Sunday, when will you fast? What day will you fast? Monday. Monday. But what will you do on a Sunday? Taraweeh. Why? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa never prayed taraweeh even once on the first of Ramadan. Unanimously agreed issue. Nobody can prove Rasulullah ever prayed taraweeh on the first of Ramadan. Or the whole month. You know who started taraweeh? In the time of Umar radiallahu anhu. And who is Umar? <coughs> Month of Ramadan is telling you, recognize the status of Umar, especially radiallahu anhu. Because in the lifetime of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Quran did not exist in the form of a book. The Quran had been revealed. Allah had taken person. You know when Quran used to be revealed upon Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah would repeat. Have you ever seen children trying to memorize Quran? They repeat each verse, each line loudly and mashallah in a way so that it gets committed to their memory. So when Jibreel would bring Quran upon Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah would hasten to repeat it with Jibreel. Allah said to Rasulullah لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجلبه don't move your tongue with the re revelation. That's not your responsibility. It is our responsibility to gather it and have it read. So throughout Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life, Quran had not been compiled. But Allah took responsibility for it. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away, then there was a battle with a man. His name was Musaylima Kazab. The great liar, Musaylimah, he laid a claim to being a Nabi. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stated, after him there will be 30 such mega liars, imposters who will claim to be Nabi. So after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anybody who lays, lays claim to being a Nabi simply cannot be a Nabi, but he has to be a prolific liar. In, after Rasool, in Rasulullah's time, a man by the name of Musaylimah Kadhaab laid a claim. Recent times, there had been another Musaylimah. <coughs> Do you know his name? There's a man called Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Qadiani. He laid a claim to being a Nabi as well. Rasulullah said there'll be 30 such imposters, mega liars, who will lay a claim to being a Nabi. So the Sahaba had a battle with him. Many Sahaba were, were martyred. So as Umar radiallahu anhu was seeing many sahaba had been martyred, he came to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and said, Abu Bakr, you must sanction the compilation and collection of Quran in the form of a book. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, 
how can I do something to which Rasulullah did not sanction? As it Umar radiallahu anhu kept insisting until Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu agreed. And so Quran was compiled. Allah had said, this is my responsibility. But Allah used Umar radiallahu anhu, put it in his heart first. <coughs> Rasulullah said, لَقَدْ كَانَ in the nation, لَقَدْ كَانَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ مِنَ الْأُمَمِ مُحَدَّثُونَ فَإِنْ يَكُنْ أَحَدٌ فِي أُمَّتِي فَإِنَّهُ عُمَرٌ Verily, in the nations before you, there were people Allah used to inspire. If there's such a man in my ummah, it's Umar. So Allah put in his heart. Rasulullah said in another narration, Wallahu ja'ala al-haqqa ala lisani Umar wa qalbi. Allah has put haqq on the tongue and heart of Umar. So Umar came to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and said, Abu Bakr, you must sanction the compilation of Quran. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu agreed and he appointed another sahabi, Zayd bin Harisa, under whose supervision the Quran was collected in the form of a book. And it was collected, mashallah, and now all over the world people, mashallah, are able to memorize it. So Quran revealed by Allah upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, but it was Umar radiallahu anhu in whose heart Allah put this idea that you have to put it in the form of a book. So that's number one. What's the second favor of Umar? Radiallahu anhu upon the whole ummah. The second favor Umar radiallahu anhu did was that he ordered Ubay ibn Kaab radiallahu anhu to lead people in Taraweeh because most people can't read the Quran. And even in the time of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam and Nazar Umar, all Sahaba did not know Quran by heart. Some did, some didn't. So Ubay ibn Kaab radiallahu anhu Rasulullah said is the big qari of my ummah. So as Umar ordered him to lead people in Salat, in Taraweeh, so much so that everybody was very happy. There's another famous Habi as Ali radiallahu anhu. Once he came in his Khilafah to the Masjid and everybody was reciting Taraweeh. Hazrat Ali gave dua for Hazrat Umar. Nawwara Allahu ala Umar qabrahu kama nawwara alayna masajidana. Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu said, Oh Allah, enlighten the grave of Umar upon him as he has enlightened our masajid. So if Umar anhu had not established this practice, then this, we wouldn't have had the Taraweeh. You wouldn't have had to listen to the Quran. You wouldn't get an opportunity to listen to the whole Quran. So mashallah, when Ramadan begins and the Qari sahab steps on this musalla and says, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin Alif Lamin Dhalik Al Kitabu La Rayba Fi and you've been praying behind him throughout listening to the whole Quran and the day he concludes, Min al jinnati wan nas gave you the opportunity to listen to the whole Quran. Thank Allah and pray for Umar. <coughs> because of him, Allah allowed the Ummah to compile the Quran, and because of him, Allah made it easy for the Ummah to listen to the whole Quran. Second thing, the next thing, a lot of people have to thank the Umar for, especially is that when you are fasting, just as you don't eat and drink, many people, are, many youngsters sitting in here, but inshallah, Allah willing, they learn a lesson in advance. Just as you are not allowed to eat and drink, married people, married people are not allowed to have relationships. In the beginning, Muslims, their fasts were like the fasts of the people of the book, that they would begin their fast before sleeping. They prayed their Isha, said whatever prayers they wanted to pray, came home, ate whatever they want, did whatever they want, then fell asleep. If they fell asleep, they couldn't do anything in the morning. When, even if they get up at the Hajjud time, they can pray the Hajjud, but they can't eat and drink. Umar ta'ala was in the month of Ramadan with the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa after Isha prayer. And he spent a lot of time, became quite late. He went home, he was a married man, his wife was sleeping and he felt he wanted to, to be with his wife and he awakened his wife and his wife said, well I've fallen asleep, meaning, sorry you can't, but he said, you've fallen asleep, I haven't. So he became close to her and in the morning when Umar came to the masjid, 
Allah did not send Jibreel with a warning, Umar, you should have behaved yourself. <laughs> no, whatever Umar did, Allah then allowed all the Muslims. Allah has made it lawful for you, permissible for you, if you want to approach your wives, eat and drink in the morning as well. No problem. Because of Umar, your fasting was reduced. Otherwise, now it would have been almost 24 hours fasting. Uh, because, because of but Umar and some other Sahaba, there was one other Sahabi, he used to work very hard in his farm, in his business. He came home in Ramadan very tired. His wife hadn't prepared the, the food in time. So he lay down and he fell asleep. And now, because he fell asleep, now he couldn't eat anything once he was awakened. And so then Allah revealed these verses. And so when people say, well, Rasulullah used to pray A, who knows Rasulullah better than Umar? And so the month of Ramadan, month of Quran, month of fasting, month of dua, month of forgiveness, month of paradise. But along with that, suppose anybody sitting here fasted, not just in Ramadan, every day of your life you fasted, except those days that you're not allowed to fast, like on the day of Eid. Suppose you fasted every day, other day of your life. Suppose you spent not just Ramadan nights in Tarawih, every night of your prayer, in, in every night of your life in prayer. Suppose you gave every penny that you ever earned in charity. Can you still put your hand on your heart and say, I'm definitely going to paradise? Huh? No, you can't. Allah doesn't like pride, arrogant people. We can do, we should do our best, but be humble and pray to Allah, Ya Allah, accept whatever we have done. We can't boast about anything, but there were certain great individuals, Rasulullah mentioned by name and gave guarantee of paradise. Abu Bakr fil Jannah, Umar fil Jannah, Uthman fil Jannah, Ali fil Jannah, and six others by name in Jannah. So these are blessed people. Umar radiallahu anhu was promised paradise by Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So some people say, well, Rasulullah did this, Umar did this. Allahu Akbar. What are you trying to say? Umar didn't know Rasulullah? If anybody knew Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam well, there was only one man who knew Rasulullah better than Umar, and that was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Otherwise, Umar, Allahu Akbar. Rasulullah said, Allahumma izza al-Islam bi Amr bin Hisham wa Umar bin Khattab. Honor Islam with either Abu Jahl or Umar. Allah chose Umar. And so Umar radiallahu ta'ala because of him, Allah blessed the Ummah with the Quran that we have now. Because of Umar radiallahu anhu, Allah blessed the Ummah with Tarawi. And Allahu Akbar. Just as Maulana was saying, that in the month of Ramadan, mashallah, every nafil thing you do, Allah equals it to a faraz. Every faraz thing you do, Allah multiplies it by seven. Most people can't recite Quran properly. But in Ramadan, you have an opportunity, Qari Sahib reciting the whole Quran. And if a person walks out halfway, what's he saying? If the whole Quran is listening to the whole Quran, which is the reason why all of the Ramadan is coming out, then the man who goes out after reading some prayers, what is he saying? He is the answer of the question. Is that the attitude for a Muslim to have? Who knows whether you get another opportunity next year or not? So much reward in the month of Ramadan, in the masjid, with the jamaat, Quran being recited, in salah, and somebody doesn't want to listen to the whole Quran. Is he really doing justice to Quran? Ah, no. So this is an opportunity not to walk out, but to remain steadfast and listen. And for mashallah, enjoy Quran recitation. Who knows? <coughs> I'm sure you know many people who are with the, with, in the community last year and they are not with us this year. Who knows who will be around till the end of Ramadan or next year. May Allah bring back many such blessed months 
in our lives again and again. The little that we do with the help of Allah, His Tawfiq, His Hidayat, what is our reality? We are nothing. Allah, Allah blessed us with Iman. Allah blessed us with Islam. Allah blessed us with Quran. Allah blesses us with Ramadan. And we need to make the most of it. If nothing else, we are not anything. When everybody's fasting is easy to fast, by all means, recite as much Quran as you can. Make all the du'as that you can. Give all the sadqa that you can. By all means, do whatever good that you can. But the least that every Muslim should do is listen to the whole Quran being recited in which prayer? The Rabi. Yes. Amongst the Sahaba, there were many differences in many things. Sahaba mein bohat se masail mein ikhtilaf tha. But there are two issues in which there was absolutely no ikhtilaf whatsoever. Do masle aise hain. Aur masal mein takriban sab mein ikhtilaf tha. Do masle aise hain. Jab wo tay huye, ek aadmi ne bhi ikhtilaf nahi ki. Not a single sahabi made any difference. One is 20 rakat tarawi and the other is three tarawis in one sitting. When it was legislated, not a single person spoke up. When not a single person spoke up, when Umar radiallahu anhu, even Ibn Taymiyyah has stated that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu ordered Ubayy ibn Kaab to lead people 20 rakat rawi and 3 rakat witr, not a single soul raised a single word. Who has any right to make anything? So when a person walks out halfway, Imams being recited, please forgive me, but he's giving a practical demonstration. He's saying, I don't need the reward. Is that the attitude for a Muslim to have? So many Muslims praying, Masha listening to the Quran, and a man just to walk out, no, no, Rasulullah didn't pray. So what you are saying, Umar didn't know what Rasulullah was saying? It's not a question of 8 or 20 at all. It's a question of what Umar and Sahaba did. Is that right or not? This is why those who don't respect Sahaba, don't respect Umar, they don't pray Trabi at all. You know who I mean? They say Rasulullah didn't pray, so we won't pray. They don't pray Tarabi. Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'a, who believe Sahaba and especially Umar to be on Haq, then they do exactly what Umar did. They pray 20. There's another Makhluk in between. Jo Sahaba ko nahi mante, nahi mante, aur hidayat par nahi samajte. What all the Sahaba on Haq or not? Were they on the right path or not? So it's not a question of 8 or 20. It's a question what Sahaba did. Under the order of Umar, is that right or not? If that's right, then we should be praying.